Hello, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Pearl, and I'm a nephrologist at St. Michael's Hospital and uh, editor-in-chief of the uh, journal Peritoneal Dialysis International, the official journal of the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis. It gives me great pleasure to uh, moderate this webinar today with our esteemed panelists on the 2023 update on catheter-related infection recommendations. I want to remind you all that these are all freely accessible, downloadable guidelines on the ISPD website, as well as the PDI website. I also want to invite you to uh, listen to a podcast called The PD Exchange, where uh, Dr. Chow discusses these guidelines with Dr. Uh, Johnson and Dr. Nikhil Shah. I want to remind everybody that this is an ISN, uh, ISPD joint webinar, and so we're very fortunate to partner with the International Society of Nephrology. And I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions during the webinar, please make sure to put them in the question and answer section um, of the Zoom area. So to get things off, I'm going to introduce our lead speaker, uh, Dr. Chow. Dr. Chow is the lead author for the 2023 ISPD catheter infection guidelines. He's currently chairman of the Hong Kong Society of Nephrology and is chief of service at the Department of Medicine and Therapeutics at the Prince of Wales Hospital. Dr. Chow, we all look so forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let me share my screen to us. Now, uh, I must take this opportunity to thank ISN for organizing this webinar to disseminate the uh, knowledge from the ISPD recommendation 2023 update on the capital infection. In fact, in 2016, we have the peritonitis treatment and prevention guideline, and that was updated one year ago. In 2017, we have the capital related infection that was uh, published in 2017 and then newly uh, updated in 2023. So today we are focusing on the right hand side to 2023 new updated guidelines on capital infection. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, this is an open access article, so all of us can, can get access to it to, to this uh, uh, new guideline. I also like to take this opportunity to thank all my great team who come up with this uh, 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 important guideline. In particular, I would like to thank Dr. Fibley and Dr. Johnson for leading this uh, important guideline update. So we have authors from all over the world, from uh, Africa, from America, Europe, and Asia. So we hope we can have uh, enough uh, uh, representative to make this guideline more uh, applicable to all countries. For just a few words on the nomenclature of the 2023 up ISPD guideline. We usually would say we recommend and we suggest. When we say we recommend, that is a one, and we when we say that we suggest, that's two. But of course, whether we recommend or we suggest, there will be A and B and C and D are going to be great guidelines. So in this presentation, I will try to use red color to not to, uh, denote those that are new change from the 2017 version. Just a quick reminder for every one of us who have been familiar with the grading of the recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation. The A certainty means that we are, have a lot of confidence that the true effect is really similar to the estimate effect. For D, that means the true effect is probably markedly different from the estimate effect. B and C is in the middle. And I must say that for the peritoneal dialysis capital related infection guideline, most of the certainty level will be in grade C. That means we really are having low certainty. The true effect might be markedly different from the estimate effects. So this speaks for the necessity for all of us to come with more updated uh, uh, study so that we can have more uh, uh, high level evidence. If we look at the blue color, that represents the 2017 version. You can see that many of them are in the C uh, or uh, category. And the red cut, the orange color in the 202B represents the new one. Um, we have more recommendations that are not graded because we come with more recommendations. And most of them, in, you can see that in the two, we have them a lot of 2C recommendations, not really a lot in A, not even one in 2A, just a few in 1A. 
So this gives you a rough idea how certain the offers are about your recommendation and suggestions. So you are totally all right to take our words with a pinch of salt. But still, I will try to make use of three case scenarios to illustrate how we can apply the new 202B ISV guideline on managing capital related infections. For the first case, this is a patient who has been referred for the care of the PD catheter two weeks after 10 cough syrup insertion in another hospital. And the patient voice out, he has some discomfort at the exit site. And now, the question is, how do we diagnose this is an exercise infection? And are there any recommendations to count the infection rate? Now for the question one, how to diagnose or define an exercise infection? For the 2017 and 2023 guidelines, um, we keep the, we suggest that definite exercise infection is defined as the pleasant tolerant discharge. This is a key word, the current discharge, with or without ephema at the skin at the interface. This is not great because it's a definition. And in the 202V, we suggest that in the absence of the current discharge, other signs of inflammation, such as ephema, tenderness, swelling, granuloma, or clot formation, are not sufficient to definitely diagnose exercise infection. So in the 202V, we particularly say that we need a presence of the current discharge to make a definite diagnosis of exercise infection. So the key for us to remember the diagnosis, if there's some perfect cavity ephema without current discharge, it can be allergic skin reaction, it can be some trauma to the cavity, it can be some reaction to the dressing materials. Of course, we might not uh, say that this must not be infection, but this is not definite. So if you really worry about early infection, you should monitor for any subsequent development of current discharge, and then you can make your diagnosis. On the other hand, if you just swap the exercise with a positive culture result, but the skin exercise look totally normal to you, there's no print discharge, the skin are all right. This does not mean there's infection. Most likely, this is just a colonization of the skin. So we should not routinely swap the exercise and say that this is infection, even if the result came back to be so-called positive. I will try to give you an idea what is exercise infection. This is a picture taken from my patient one week ago. He did have some discomfort and exercise, and you can quickly see that some ephema are known the uh, tunnel area. So we should examine the exercise carefully. As you can see, when we try to touch on the tunnel side and squeeze it, there's a definite presence of current discharge coming out from the exercise. So with that, you can have quite strong evidence or confidence to say that this is a case of exercise infection. With the skin change and the tendons along the tunnel, you can even call this is a case of tunnel infection. So in the 202V update, we suggest that the tunnel infection is defined as the presence of clinical inflammation, such as ephema, swelling, tenderness of induration, with or without an ultrasound evidence of collection are uh, anywhere along the capital tunnel. If this is really tunnel infection, you can uh, 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 diagnose it with uh, without ultrasound. But of course, ultrasound nowadays is commonly available at bedside. So for my patient, I can use a probe to apply on the skin, and then usually you will see some tunnel uh, infection by the ultrasound. This is a tunnel, this is a capital. Usually, you, if you apply the probe, you can see some white line here, suggest of the inner surface of the capital. If you, 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 you try to be careful, you can sometimes see another black line uh, uh, on the top. And then these two represent the inner surface of the capital. But you can pay attention to the area surrounding here, for instance, the uh, uh, turquoise color here. This is an area of infection, which is a collection of fluid. Of course, I do not use Doppler. Sometimes you can even use some Doppler color to suggest a change there. 
This is another picture of the top, top normal capital on the top left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you can see some sonorosin shown around the distal cuff, and this is a infection spreading to the skin. On the left, on the right lower top panel, this is just a longitudinal view of a cavity. Apart from ultrasound, do we really need a scoring system? Yes, in the old days, we have this scoring system that subsequently modified to say that we assess the score of hyperfema, gap, pain, edema, granuloma, each giving one either zero and one or two, and then you add them up. If there's more than four, it's usually an exercise infection. Uh, recently, there was a large uh, uh, study in Bashir talking about almost 3,000 patients. They tried to compare the scoring system versus the current discharge criteria, but the concordance coefficient was not too impressive, only 60%. And in fact, the concordance was lower for the African Americans. That means use a scale for diagnosing exercise infection does not add much information. So we still can use the current discharge as the key diagnostic criteria. In the 2023 guideline, we also mentioned that we would commit exercise infection to be classified according to organisms. And then we also try to suggest that culture and active exercise infection is defined when the exercise infection is diagnosed using the criteria above, but no organism is defined or was identified. And we count according to causative organism, this will facilitate the benchmarking and CQI activities. We also have a term called insertion related exercise infection. That means any infection of exercise within 30 days of the cap insertion, we call it cap insertion related exercise infection. We use the 30 days as a cutoff. So going back to the scenario one, this is two weeks after cap infection. So if you really have current discharge, we say this is a cap related insertion related infection. As to how to count, uh, we would commend every program to the monitor at least yearly for the incidence of a catheter-related infection. We also suggest the weight of catheter infection should be presented as a number of episodes per year. We recommend every program to measure and monitor them uh, uh, year, uh, uh, yearly, similar to 2017, but we specifically mentioned that organism-specific infections should be counted. We also suggest that tunnel infections should be separately reported. For counting peritonitis, we can have the capital insertion here and then count the capital related infection within 30 days. And then we also have a term called PPD peritonitis. That means counting the peritonitis occurring before PD insertion. But for exercise infection, we don't have to see whether the PD is in, in, in initial or not. We just count the insertion related infection within 30 days. And then after we call this a capital infection. As to the way of benchmarking, um, there's a, quite a wide variation of uh, current exercise infection. In some countries, they even do not count exercise infection. So we still have a lot of work to catch up. But if you look at the publication on the exercise infection, talking about those with case number more than 50, 50 you can see that the exercise infection is talking about from 0.11 to 0.41 episodes per year. So there's still quite a different uh, uh, preference or instance of exercise infection. So to make it simple and easy for everyone to have a benchmarking, then 2023 recommendation we use 0.3 episode, 0.4 episode per year at least as the, the, the benchmark. The 0.4 is the same as the 0.4 episode of peritonitis per year for the 2022 uh, peritonitis guideline. For the insertion related infection, we should make it less than 5% of all capital inserted. Let's move on to the scenario number two. A patient came back to dialysis after reporting ear femur and pus from the exercise. The swab was taken for culture. What should be the antibiotic of choice? And how long should we prescribe all antibiotics? In the 2017, the empirical antibiotic is uh, to cover Staphylococcus aureus. And then usually we recommend a first generation sulfosporin or anti staphylococcal methanicin, unless the patient has a recent history of infection with MRSA or pseudomonas, in which case you may have to modify the antibiotics. This is a 201, uh, 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 2017 and 202 uh, uh, guideline uh, that are more or less the same. So these are the first line antibiotics we usually use. You can use either or mantine or first-generation cell or even coxacillin. 
But the question is, how long should we treat the patient with an exercise infection? The long and short, the duration of antibiotic treatment of capital-related infection used to be guided by an educated guess rather than any hard data. We don't have that randomized control trial. So we should ask ourselves, is it less, is more, or how much is too much, and how much is too short? In 2017, the recommendation said that we should come, uh, recommend extra infection to be treated for at least two weeks, irrespective of organism, except pseudomonas can be extend to three weeks. This is great as 1C in 2017. And in the 2023, uh, we say that actually we suggest antibiotic duration should be adjusted according to clinical response, the swap culture, in vitro sensitivity results. We also suggest that a fixed two weeks antibiotic treatment of choice can be shortened to seven to 10 days if there's a resolution of infection as confirmed by the clinical evasion at around one week. We gave 2D, not high evidence, but this is a new recommendation in the 202B version. We recommend exercise infection caused by pseudomonas to be treated with at least three weeks of antibiotics. We also recommend that any tunnel infection to be treated with at least three weeks of effective antibiotics. So if we use a chart to, to delineate it, so once we diagnose an exercise infection, we should give them all antibiotics and adjust the antibiotics according to the organism. Say pseudomonas, we treat for three weeks, other bacteria treat for two weeks, but we need to assess whether there's good response. If there's real good clinical response, we can consider shortening antibiotic course to seven to 10 days. And then of course, we should at the same time worry about other typical organisms and then decide accordingly. But if this is a tunnel infection, the key is still three with the antibiotics. And if there's a concomitant peritonitis, we may have to remove the capsules. Now for the duration of treatment of infection, you can see that a lot of other infections, not in PD, the treatment uh, randomization trial with short versus long course, most of the time there's no difference. So we really, really can see that there's a trend towards less is more. We don't have to unnecessarily prolong antibiotic use. For treatment of skin infection, soft tissue infection, there's no biomarker validated to guide the discontinuation of the treatment. The FDA licensing trial record the use of seven to 40 days of treatment without any clear justifications. If you look at the Spanish guideline, five to 10 days for uncomplicated psoriasis and 40 to 21 days for severe cases. For IDSA guideline, for treatment of a psoriasis infection, they recommend from seven days up to 14 days. For MRSA, they may have a little bit different uh, uh, for the treatment duration. But what's the difference between usual psoriasis and PD capital site infection? Now, capital infection of PD capital is slightly different because there's a front material. Therefore, I would say that clinical assessment is the key to determine the duration of treatment. And of course, we need to take into consideration the culture result and susceptibility. And for the recommended treatment duration, we should remember we come from the day of the effective antibiotics. There are actually some reasons to avoid prolonged antibiotics. Firstly, there's insufficient data to support a fixed two-week course. Number two, the risk factor of fungal peritonitis in PD patients, antibiotic use within one month is a strong predictor of subsequent fungal infection. So that's why we will try to avoid unnecessary prolonged antibiotic use. Therefore, we should really evaluate the patient at around one week, by which time you usually will have the culture result and the susceptibility result, and then you can also clinically assess whether the infection has been improved or not. So remember to assess the patient around one week after starting antibiotics. Of course, for some scenario, we will use more prolonged antibiotics. For example, complicated conditions such as a tunnel infection, virulent organisms such as a pseudomonas, and of course, a typical organism is also coming up. The non-tuberculosis mycobacterium is really nasty. We usually will need two agents with individual activity and sometimes can cause care removal for the source control. Now let's move to the last scenario. A CAPD patient has a pseudomonas exercise infection. 
he has been already treated with pepticillin and ciprofloxacin, two agents, and there's some improvement after more than two weeks of effective antibiotics. But there's a recurrence of pseudomonas exercise infection two weeks after completing the treatment. But this patient is very keen to continue PD instead of capital removal. Are there any checks that we can do uh, facilitate this uh, uh, wish? In our 2023 uh, recommendation, we suggest capital to be removed when patients have excess infection, tongue infection that progress to peritonitis due to the same organism. For our case, there's no peritonitis yet. Therefore, we could also think about simultaneous removal and reinsertion of PD cover with a new exercise under antibiotic coverage when the exercise or tunnel infection do not resolve with effective antibiotic use. So for Desinol C3, uh, uh, we can probably think about this 2C suggestion to have a simultaneous removal and reinsertion of PD if he's very keen to con continue the dialysis of it using PD. We recommend simultaneous removal and insertion to be avoided when there's a deep tough involvement of con or concurrent peritonitis. We also suggest that a surgical salvage procedure can be considered as an alternative to simultaneous cattle replacement in selected patients. Example, cup removal or cup saving can be considered in patients who got external cup extrusion and exercise infection refractory to antibiotics. We gave two C grading. We also suggest that exercise relocation to be considered in patients with exercise infection refractory to antibiotics. We also gave it two C grading. For the extrusion of external cup with infection, this is probably a site for bacteria sitting and exercise infection, and that explains the senior free patient who got recurrent pseudomonas infection. So if the infection is really limited to exercise, we can seriously consider removal or shaving the external cup. This strategy has been initially used for relapse with Peter pseudomonas exercise infection, and then subsequent in other causative organisms. That was supported by uh, subsequent observing studies. And we left with pit of a staphylococcus for caucus always exercise infection after external cup saving has been reported in only 70%, not more than 50% in three different studies. So this make me think about a goalkeeper. The goalkeeper is the, exercise, the external cup. But in case this is a really urgency, the goalkeeper can go out. You sacrifice it, but you, you try to salvage the condition. Of course, when the uh, goalkeeper go outside the penalty box, they can use their hands. So the cup is sacrificed. I would say this is the, 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 the word. For example, in this study published in PDI, they try to look at patients who got infection of the exercise, and then they try to use the shaping strategy as a salvage to, uh, uh, to sacrifice the external cup and see whether they can get rid of the infection. In fact, you can see that from the that, uh, uh, result that they published for staphylococcus infection, the success rate was 80 something percent. Even for pseudomonas, the success rate was 62 percent. Quite impressive to most of us. So if you have the external cup coming out and infected, you can probably shape it, but be careful of cutting the catheter. You really need to have you use a braid and then use it carefully. And then once we move it a few weeks later, the infection can be really settled. Sometimes you can remove the cup, uh, like my case, that I can remove almost intact. There are other surgical interventions that we can use uh, apart from simultaneous care in intervention. If there's a surgery called relocating the exercise, a uh, catheter was spliced with removal of the infected catheter remnant. You can have catheter diversion with cup shaping, unmoving wound excision, or unblocked recession with cut shaping. That's been reported in different number of studies, and the success rate was ranging from 60 something percent up to 97 percent. So, this is something that we just think about and in our mind. And, ladies and gentlemen, I probably will conclude here that in the 2023 update for the capital related infection, we have covered new definition of exercise infection, tunnel infection. We also mentioned about the monitoring for separate organisms. And then we also try to first the time suggest that there's a benchmark still upon four episodes per year as our, our goal to keep. And then for the prevention, you will listen to more on this in the next talk by Anna. 
for treatment, we should use antibiotics as the first line, and then three weeks for pseudomonas. For other organisms, we probably keep it two weeks, and if there's an early improvement, we can cut it off. And there's some surgical intervention that we can consider. So we will stop here and let Anna to talk more about the prevention aspect, which is even more important than treatment. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chow. And I just want to remind everybody we'll be addressing questions at the end of both talks in the panel discussion. So our second esteemed speaker is uh, Dr. Figueroa, who is a professor at the School of Nursing at the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, Brazil. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, she has a PhD in Health Sciences Nephrology from PUCRS and uh, has been on the uh, Kidney Health Professionals Working Group of the ISN and worked in nephrology nursing since 1985. Wow, that's uh, unbelievable. Uh, with an interest in uh, PD patient education and quality improvement in PD. So we very much look forward to hearing your presentation. And of course, the role of the nurses in these guidelines is critical uh, for implementation. Thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. First of all, I'd like to thank the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure as a nurse to be sharing this platform with Dr. Sho that has given us a really, really interesting presentation and a palatable way to, to see the guidelines. Uh, I hope to do a, a good job as he did before me. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Just a minute. So I'm going to talk about the nurse's point of view on the guidelines. Uh, some of the issues may be overlapping with what Dr. Sho has presented, but the idea here is to show how the nurses can make the difference or how uh, improving the knowledge of nurses regarding exit site care can uh, improve outcome for our patients. So the learning objectives are going to uh, emphasizes what's important for nurses in these guidelines. Of course, all the treatment, everything Dr. Shu has uh, presented that is very important, but there is small issues that can be more important to nurses to keep a, a good eye on it. Uh, as we know, PD nurses are essential to a PD program. We do all the teaching, we do uh, most of the follow-up of these patients. But when we're talking about exit site infection preventive measures, we are the ones usually seeing the patients, first of all, recognizing uh, we are responsible for reporting, documenting the PD exit site and to new infection as described by Dr. Shaw. And usually are the nurses that are going to do the follow-up either way with the patients on the out clinic or uh, by remote monitoring with photographs sent by patients. We are the ones doing this follow-up to see if the patient is adhering to the prescribed medication or the suggested exit site care for these patients and actually reporting the treatment response for that. Uh, Dr. Sharon has shown the new, what's new in the guidelines. I would like to address some issues about the dressing, uh, the importance of the calculation, the monitoring of the exit site rates, and also some uh, comments about how to deal with the granulums. It was very well approached by Dr. Schoen, how the exit site infection classification and terminology has changed. But uh, as a nurse, we tend to see that every redness or any alteration of the health exit site care can be a sign of infection. We have to keep in mind that this uh, is not infection, maybe it's an uh, allergic reaction or uh, any other issue, but is not infection. We need the purulent discharge to classify as infection. As you can see here, some of my exercise from my patients, you have some redness here. And also this one is just like a four weeks after insertion, we have an allergic reaction for the foreign uh, catheter is not considered then an infection. So you need to have this exit site, uh, the discharge of the purulent uh, secretion to consider it. And again, the other definition that I think is important for nurses to keep in mind is the 
refractory catheter related infection that is defined as failure to respond after two weeks. But we have to consider that these two weeks should be on effective antibiotic therapy. Uh, I think Dr. Sean has shown even better the scoring system, the old one by Tordovsky that was very complicated for nurses and doctors to assess the difference of uh, dubious and the perfect health, care, uh, health exit site. Said that was never used properly, I believe, because no one knew exactly where the borderline between one classification and the other. Then we had the scoring systems giving points to each of the events that could happen, erythema or edema. Uh, but no, none of these have shown any difference in classifying, determine the exit site infection. But although they haven't shown this, I believe that we as a nurse should look forward to something that is easy and if not uh, identify the infection, at least identifying exit site at risk of having infection. So we should look forward and have more studies trying to identify because we have to also teach our patients how to monitor these exit site infection at home. And maybe this scoring system can help alert the patients to come to us to seek uh, help before they have these uh, purulent discharge. So although they haven't shown any uh, correlation to the exit site infection, they may help us to identify patients at risk and to help us to teach patients to identify when they need to seek uh, immediate help to avoid uh, other complication. When we're talking here about CQI, it's being recommended in almost all the guidelines. And why it's recommended? Because we know that there is a difference when you have a continuous quality improvement program, because you're going to measure what you're doing. There is no way to benchmark, compare yourself if you don't know what your numbers, how you doing, if you're doing well or not, you need this uh, control that's measurement the indicators. And I believe the nurse should be the head of this uh, continuous quality improvement because we have the information and we have to share this with a multidisciplinary team to oh look for to the numbers and see how we can improve this for the patient. So the Bertonite's guidelines, these guidelines all bring together the importance of having the CQI uh, at least once a year. Uh, we should measure what's happened, we, have, we can have trends of the infection and be alert that something is going on with our patients. Uh, I would say that the best uh, exit site infection would be zero, but <laughs> this is almost impossible, but as near zero as we can get is better. And this new recommendation uh, show us 0.4 episode per year at risk. Sometimes it's difficult for nurses to translate these numbers to real uh, scenario. So it's important for us to understand how this number is uh, achieved. You need to get the rates measure and number exit site infection or tuning infection episode divide by the number of patients years at risk. Uh, understand this concept is important for you to understand when you're going to measure or compare yourself with other units. Sometimes the, the exit site infection was reported a percentage of patients have infection, and that is quite difficult because it depends on the number of patients you have in your program. With these measurements, it levels because you consider patients you're at risk of it, so it doesn't matter how many patients you have in your program. The other issue that is very important here is that we should uh, report organism specific related. It's important for us. If all our patients have Staphylococcus uh, coagulase negative or Staphylococcus exit site infection, something is happening to our patients. 
Are they doing the prophylaxis? What's the, the care they having at home? Are they cleaning it every day? Are they using other products that are not recommended? What's happening? If you have pseudomonas infection, we should pay attention. Maybe the water quality at home, what they do in the exit site uh, cleaning is not the best. And we should be aware that knowing the microorganism that is caused this exit site infection may help us to elucidate with the patients what's happened to them at home because this is mostly related to the care the patients are having at home with their exit site or their catheter. So it's important this uh, classification defining different microorganisms. Prevention measures, we can have like catheter placement, uh, the catheter design, training, and exit site care that I'm going to talk a little bit more. Uh, we all know that PD training has been shown to play a vital role in decreasing the risk of catheter-related infection. Although we, we believe it, and I, especially as a nurse, believe that the way we teach patients will make a huge difference in the outcomes of the therapy, uh, we still are not able to, to say what's the best training protocol, how many hours, how many days there is a huge variation in all the studies that have been done, PDOPs and the guidelines for SPD, we suggest a number of hours based on other studies, but there is no study proving or 1A uh, level of evidence that will show this is the best way to do. We know, and there is few studies showing that uh, retraining patients can improve the outcomes, but although they are not strong enough evidence for us to suggest any specification on how to train patients to do PD or how to train patients to care for their exit site. Other issue that uh, is in the guidelines, but I think nurses should be more aware is uh, catheter placement. We're not involved though, uh, most of the countries in catheter placement ourselves, uh, although uh, Elaine in England does it, is important to assist in marking the patient's abdomen correctly. And uh, sometimes we had the surgeons that are not involved with the PD program, and it's up to the nephrologist or the nurse to make sure that we see the patient, we see the abdomen, see if there is scars, fat tissue, and we decide with the team how to where this catheter we're going to exit because that's the first topic. If there is in the improper way, is in the middle of a, a fat tissue or with the clothes of the patient having friction, having trauma to this exit site, the problem starts right there on the catheter placement. There is a few uh, tools that can be used to help marking the exit site. I put here a link from the a presentation from Dr. Cabtri that is in the uh, ISPD website that's very interesting, give uh, step by step how to mark it and give suggestions what a assessment should be made. And nurses can contribute to the best exit site uh, uh, placement for this catheter. So we, we can make the difference here as a preventive. This is the first step where the catheter is exiting. What is the recommendation? And I made sure to bring here a paper from 1996 from Doc, uh, Barbara Proant and Dr. Fordovsk and saying what are the principles for the care of healed exit site. And when you see it, 1996 and the guidelines for 2023, there's no much difference. We still need to cleanse every other day or at least two times a week. If the patient lives in a uh, country uh, with hot weather, maybe daily should be cleaned depending on the area of patient. But the recommendation is almost the same. Anytime uh, the exit site is wet or dirty. And this maybe is overlooked in the, the, the guidelines the importance of teaching patients, teaching the clinicians, 
the nurses to wash their hands prior to doing anything with the exit side. Can it seem better? Oh, that's obvious. Maybe not. We should reinforce the need to wash your hands anytime before touching the exit side. And it can contribute to that. So the guidelines, they say daily topical application of cream of the catheter prevent exit site can be cleaned as the barber prone said before twice weekly or every time after shower or vigorous exercise and here we're going to combine this orientation with the swimming orientation that is going to be our water exercise that we're going to talk about the pd catheter exit site care should be continued even if the patient is not on PD. If the patient has been transplanted, if the, the patient has a period off of dialysis, the exit site should be cared exactly the same if the patient was using it daily. It's not because it's not dialyzed that we have discontinued the, the care for the exit site. And the other issue that has been uh, repeating itself because we believe there is uh, important correlation in infection is the immobilization or anchoring of the catheter to avoid trauma and consequently avoid infection. But again, there is no studies comparing uh, different kinds of anchoring or immobilization of the catheter. Other issue that was brought to, in the guidelines is is there any cleanest agent that's better than others? No. And PDOPS has shown that, again, a variation of what kind of agents are used to clean the exit site. And the most common is antibacterial soap or even common soap you using during your shower to clean the exit site. Uh, there is some, some uh, places using chlorhexidine or povidine, but Again, this is the paper from 1996 from Robert Prova and, and Dr. Twardowski saying again how to uh, improve. Important for the first uh, two weeks of the exit site care should be done by a nurse that is specialized, prepared for that, is a, a SAP technique at the beginning. But once the catheter is healed, you can use any of these agents to clean. But if you're using uh, povidine or uh, hydrogen peroxide or other uh, substances that are more irritating, you should be using it carefully, not damage the skin surround the exit site. And that's one of the major issues when we teach patients to be uh, adherent to how they are going to use these uh, elements for the cleaning agents to clean the exit site, to only use at the exit site, not in the whole skin around it, because we can damage it and damage the skin will be more propense, more prone to infection. So that's what I said, having attention when you're using creams or ointments, not to damage the catheter. That's what the uh, PDOPS has shown. You can see here, uh, large variation in the uh, clean agents that were used in different countries. Uh, some use none. Japan was one of, have a huge variation. Uh, based on these and others, we, uh, in the, ex uh, the guidelines, suggest there is no agent that is better than other. And again, calling attention for nurses here, this is an area that we need more studies. Maybe only no antibacterial soap is enough. Would be the cheapest agent to use for most of our patients and maybe the safest one. But we need more studies to be able to confirm that there is any superior or known inferior uh, uh, results from these uh, agents that can be used. Dressing. Dressing is another issue that we need more studies. Uh, until recently, it was like almost forbidding to say to the patients, leave your exit side without any dressing. 
they should be covered. Nowadays, we know that dressing after the healing of the catheter is being established can be done as patient's preference. It's not mandatory. You can use, if the exit site is health, you can just use it without the dressing, but making sure it's anchoring. The important thing is not covering the exit site, but making sure there will not be any trauma to the catheter by having this catheter moving around. So it's important to immobilizing the catheter. There is no study showing if only with micropore, with the patient used to have a special fixation uh, device to immobilize the catheter. So we need more studies around that. The other important thing about the dressing is the goals and micropore uh, can be used for the first weeks. Uh, should be avoid the, the more impermeable dressing because they are not absorbing if there is any drainage. But apart from that, the important thing from these guidelines is dressing cover is not mandatory after exit site care is uh, healed. And that we consider around four to six weeks before allowing patients to say, okay, what's the best for you? You prefer to cover it because you don't like to see it. No, you don't like it. You can just anchor it. That's important thing. The patient cannot leave the catheter just moving around. Swimming has been another issue that we discussed for AIDS. And again, we have some information, but we don't have any clinical trial or any other studies that give us more confidence to say that it can be done. What we know so far is from one study from Australia with a small population that using this kind of dressing, impermeable dressing, when you're doing water sports or swimming can uh, help but you have to clean your exit site just after you done you went swimming or you're doing any water sports. So the cleaning afterwards is the most important. They can use uh, colostomy bags to protect it. But one important thing is to provide this information for patients that they can do these kind of sports, but they have to go in uh, waters the clean, we suggest seawater or swimming pools that are private and well cared for. So you have to take some uh, careful uh, thought about which kind of water you're going to practice your sport or you're going to swim. But once you've done it, you should protect your exercise with impermanent dressing or a colostomy bag. And after the exercise, you should clean it and redress your exit site properly. Uh, and the, and the guidelines say that you can use uh, silver nitrate to the management of granulomas. And again, is another issue, how to use it. It's not available in every place. Uh, and we know there is a very good result from that, but you sh just should be careful when using it on these granulomas here that are large, are quite easy to use, but it's important to use only in the granuloma area and not in the surrounding. They can burn the skin, they can damage the health skin. And then if you don't have an infection with the granuloma, it may be the risk factor to develop one. So for nurses, important thing is, Okay, we can use uh, silver nitrate to um, cure or to remove the granulum, but we have to ve be very careful to use it exactly in the granuloma and not around the skin that is a health one. There is another study shown that you can use chloroxidine, chloroxidine uh, sticks, and they can cause less burn around the exit site so it can be even better but again the important thing for nurse here is, is if you're going to to use it you have to call the patient show it how to do it make sure they understand the importance of using exactly where is the granuloma if the patient has poor eyesight you should call a, a caregiver or a relative that can 
see properly to make sure the silver nitrate used exactly on the granuloma and not in the health skin. Uh, I believe you, as a nurse, we have a key role in identifying any good, pra good practice with good outcomes, but we are not very good in publishing it. We're not very good in sharing this uh, practice that can have a good outcome. So uh, in this webinar, one of my ideas is to uh, propose that if you, you are doing a different uh, care for the exit side that you can see good results in our center, you need to share it. We need to, to understand other ways. Uh, the other issue that I think is important in this webinar, uh, not always the nurses have access to the guidelines, although they, they are uh, available in the site, they're not aware that the new guidelines have uh, come. So translation of the guidelines to clinical practice sometimes uh, is a barrier that we should uh, address to make sure that these uh, definitions, these uh, new topics that are brought to the guidelines can be uh, implemented in the clinical practice. In summary, nurses have a crucial role in managing exit site and you have, we have to empower ourselves. We have to make sure that we understand every issue regarding the exit site, not only preventive measures, but how to treat, to discuss with the multidisciplinary team what's the best approach for our patient. As I said during my presentation, more studies are needed about dressing, anchoring, immobilization and training of the patients to improve the best or to have best outcomes. So we need to, we know our things are important, but what's the best way to do it? And educational strategies like this one that we have in the webinar are very important to uh, share the information in a way that's accessible to everyone. And then these guidelines can be translated into clinical practice. That's the problem for most guidelines. They just stick to the paper and it's not going forward to, to reach our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna, for an excellent presentation uh, and Dr. Chow. Um, and I just, you know, Anna, want to just say a shout out to all the nurses on the call today. You guys are so critical for exit site care and management of PD access. First of all, on behalf of myself, I wanna thank you for all uh, you do. You certainly are the backbone of our PD programs. So the uh, chat has been, the Q&A section has been really active with a lot of questions. Um, and so I'm gonna just, I think we're in the interest of trying to get through um, all of them. Let's just rapid fire through as many as we can. Uh, and I'll direct them to each of you. Um, Anna, what's your take on using anchoring tape? Uh, my experience is very good. You have to teach the patients to do like a, a lace around the catheter and it can, yeah. uh, for me, it's yeah. very good. And, and one thing I just wanna put a plug in is please all of you consider joining the ISPD if you've not. I think Anna and I and Dr. Chow have all recognized that we're going to build it's not just the guidelines, it's the guidelines plus educational resources. And Anna, you said that beautifully in your editorial. So um, I think the ISPD is really committed to developing the supporting educational resources to make sure, you know, some of these things that you showed are really amenable to like a video or a demonstration. And we really need to work on developing that. Okay, so uh, do we need to give the patients antibiotics for um, exit site granulomas without discharge? No. Okay. I Let's don't see. think so. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, saline at the exit site after catheter implantation. It is a common practice at Mexico and has been difficult to align with PD Center. So, Anna, this one's for you from Anna. Anna to Anna. <laughs> what, what's the question? Sorry, I, I lost Saline at the exit site after catheter implantation. It's a common practice in Mexico and has been difficult to align with PD Centers. Uh, sorry, what you said the first? using saline saline at oh the saline okay okay uh i don't see why not but uh you just want to clean to clean the exit site at the beginning yeah okay 
So not you're you're neither positive nor negative on that one. No, no. Okay. Um, uh, can a patient take a shower on the second day of catheter insertion, or better to delay it after one week? Anna, this is for you. Oh, definitely you should delay for a, a week or more. Definitely, the exit site should be covered for at least seven days yeah. without touching the the catheter, unless you wrap all the patient around this. Uh, impermeable <laughs> device right. otherwise no shower at the beginning yeah and, and i think that even applies for urgent start pd even if we're using oh, the catheter okay good okay uh dr chow um what you talked a lot about using systemic antibiotics for exit site infection would ip antibiotics be appropriate or efficient Yes, uh, we in the uh, IFPG 2023 guideline, we have two tables. One is the first line antibiotic. The second table is uh, second line antibiotics. They are mostly oral and systemic. Uh, but of course, sometimes when we do not want to hot fly the patient in the hospital just for the sake of IV antibiotic, we yeah. can consider intraperitoneal antibiotics. But yeah. this is different from treating peritonitis. For treating peritonitis, we want to aim for a high concentration of antibiotics in the peritoneum. So IP did have the advantage in serving that purpose. But if we are talking about treating soft tissue infection, we just can use oral antibiotics if they are viable. If not, then you can use either IP intraperitoneal or IV intravenous according to the patient's need. Yeah, I think practical issues probably dictate what the choice is. And of course, do you use nystatin antifungal prophylaxis when you're treating exit site infections with antibiotics? Uh, in fact, for the uh, antibiotic use in patients with peritoneal dialysis, we should use nystatin. So okay. in, the, uh, in the full chart in the ISPD guide, we do put down, we should use nystatin when we are using antibiotics to treat the uh, uh, exit site infection. Yeah. But just a quick word on the, uh, the anchoring tape for, uh, for Anna. Uh, I saw quite a lot of patients using a very sticky uh, uh, anchoring tape. They, they tape it so uh, uh, tightly that they cannot remove it. Some of my patients use a scissor to cut the, those anchoring tape and by accident they cut together. So we might all our patients not to use scissor close to the catheter is a nightmare. Yeah, so take <laughs> <Definitely sometimes>, not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna answer some of these on my own because in the interest of time of getting through everybody, how can we treat exit site if recurrence only by local antibiotics or switch to IP or systemic? Well, I think Dr. Chow talked about um, the idea that we really need to use um, not just local topical, but we need to use systemic and also to consider some uh, catheter removal issues for refractory exit site infections or um, catheter uh, uh, or some catheter salvage techniques. So that I think he covered. What about a positive culture in the case of an asymptomatic exit site? I think he also covered that saying, you know, you really need the purulent discharge. Part of the definition of positive culture may represent colonization. Next question. In the case of pseudomonas colonization, should we keep a patient on gentamicin cream um, or any other treatment to prevent further infection? So this is, I'm gonna broaden this question for you, KM, and say, if you know if somebody's had a previous exit site infection, for example, with a gram-negative or pseudomonas, would you change to use an aminoglycoside-based exit site ointment or cream, knowing that they have a predisposition to gram-negatives, for example? Yes, this is uh, uh, probably uh, uh, intuitive to, to use the topical gentamicin if we know this is a case of pseudomonas infection. Yes, in fact, one of the RCT PVC complaints of gentamicin versus mupralcin, uh, the mupralcin group seems to have even more fungal presence and so on. And uh, we probably can use gentamicin if we know this is pseudomonas. Great. Um... Uh, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to skip this next one because I think it will take us a little bit off topic. Um, any recommendation on the duration or treatment of fungal exit site infections? Can you comment a little bit on yeast um, at the exit site, uh, KM? Uh, I don't see many publications on fungal exit site infection. Some of them can really cap the catheter caps without removal, different from fungal peritonitis. For fungal peritonitis, we remove the catheter, there's no, no, no controversy. For exit site infection with candida, some people can use a topical antifungal. I saw some patients uh, uh, um, using uh, uh, even systemic oral uh, antifungal, and some of the patients can be managed by uh, um, uh, shaping the catheter cup, that kind of things. But there's no large case series. I do not see that many fungal exercise infections, to be honest. 
I worry more about mycobacterium non tuberculosis in yeah. bacteria. That is yeah. even more nasty than fungal. The other thing I'll say is sometimes with a, a moist uh, area of skin around the exit site, you may get a yeast skin infection around the catheter, but it may not necessarily be a fungal exit site infection. And I find in those cases, they respond very well to topical antifungals, especially if there's punctate sort of satellite lesions. It's a, a, a clue that it may be a yeast, a, a soft tissue infection around the catheter, because we uh, oftentimes keep addressing that could be moist and uh, introduce uh, fungal elements to the skin. Which brings me to the next question. Uh, this is for you, Anna. For patients in tropical or warm climates where humidity is high, do you recommend an open dressing for the exit site? Uh, actually, I would recommend an open dressing for everyone, not only for the tropical country. Well, uh, if the exit site is well healed, and we should keep that in mind, it's not after two weeks that you're going to uh, remove the dressing. But after that, if it's well healed and you see it's a perfect exit site or a very healthy one, there is no point in keep the dressing. For some patients, is another thing to irritate their skin because when, they, when they're using a dressing, they use have to, to use some kind of tape or whatever yeah. they, they're going to use. It's another factor to irritate the skin around it. I would recommend it. Okay. Um, this is a sort of, I'm going to ask both of you your, for your perspectives. We'll start with UKM and then I'll ask you, Anna. The nebulous exit site that's a little bit of red, a little scaly, but no purulent discharge. I think a lot of us struggle with whether to trial antibiotics or not. I know that we talked about how important purulent is as a rule in, but what do you do with that red irritated exit site with no purulent discharge? Would you observe that for a bit, watch to see what happens, Cam, or, or would you might give it a course of treatment to see what happens? Uh, I'll get your perspective first and then Anna's. It's really personal opinion. Uh, I will try to avoid using antibiotic if just not having any purulent discharge. In particular, we have now so many uh, ultrasound for, for us to use at bedside to exclude tunnel infection. I can uh, um, quite quite confidently exclude tunnel infection with ultrasound. And then if there's no purulent discharge, just oh, a little bit I think redness, we lost your audience. Okay. I, I will probably uh, not use antibiotics. Okay, observe. Okay, Anna? Uh, the same, I would ask the patient to intens intensify the, the care, maybe twice a, twice a day, and monitor the patient. Just make sure they are cleaning properly, they are not <laughs> leaving the, the catheter dangling, anchoring. Also, emphasize the exit site care and observing. Okay. I actually wrote a couple of questions on my own um, <laughs> that I was hoping you guys could answer. Okay, so uh, KM, you showed some really interesting data on a refractory um, exit site infections to consider unroofing or relocating of the exit site. The outcomes seem to be better in the studies that showed relocating. Why are we not recommending relocating over unroofing? Or could you comment on the decision to do one or the other? Well, uh, this is a uh, recent publication. I cannot really exclude any uh, publication bias because this is something new. Whenever there's something new, they are more likely to be published. Um, uh, there's no head-to-head uh, -head conversion between uh, antibiotics uh, versus the, uh, uh, the, the capital removal versus this kind of uh, salvage technique. Uh, and this kind of unroofing, uh, relocating of the exercise uh, is not a simple procedure. But uh, if you have expertise, I would say that this is the, uh, the way to go if we want to keep the capital and avoid those complications of a capital removal. Yeah. Um, I myself have not done a lot of uh, unroofing, so I, I cannot tell from my personal uh, experience. Okay, Anna, something I learned in your editorial, which was really interesting, is this whole shower head concept. Can you share that with everybody, your comments about the shower head and the implications? I found that really interesting, I, I learned that. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I, I can confess that we, when we're looking for the thing to, to answer the questions made in the ISPD, we come with this recommendation from CDC that uh, if you're using shower head and you have infection, the chronic patient hormones uh, propenses to have an infection, so they suggest to cleaning the uh, shower head every uh, month or so 
because there is more chance to have pseudomonas. And we actually don't think about that. We just assuming that is good water and it's okay. But we know that pseudomonas mainly is a waterborne a microorganism. Is, this can be one of the issues if the patient is showering and, uh, you know, is a recommendation from CDC. I was, again, surprised like yourself, but it's very interesting that we should keep that in mind. Yeah, no, I, I, that was really interesting. And then somebody asks about your use. Do you, do you, it seems to be you favor the use of tape to immobilize the catheter. What would be your second choice for patients who can't afford to buy the tape? Uh, they can make themselves a small, like, um, how do you yeah. <laughs> uh, made from material. I it's a belt, yes. Huh? A belt. They go around, go around their yeah. waist, and they can make it themselves with the, the same tissue they use for the clothing. I don't know how to say it. Fabric. There is like, like a, a fabric, a, a little a, mini fabric belt. Exactly. Thank you, okay. Jeff. That's okay. the fabric that they can make it, or right. even. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like we need to uh, get some patients involved with some creative ideas that have been used um, and uh, post those. Um, I guess if someone asks about uh, you, Dr. Chow, and, and how do you do the decuffing for um, so that the cuff can be in intact post cuff shaving? I think this is where a picture or a video is worth a thousand words. And I think what we, we should uh, provide a link to in the future is uh, a video of a cuff uh, shaving experience so people can see that. It's hard, it's very hard to describe in words unless you see it. Um, uh, I think it would be useful. Um, I have another question for you, KM. Um, one thing that um, is emerging in my program is atypical mycobacterial exit site infections. The problem is, and our, our infectious disease doctors say the sensitivities can take weeks to come back and may be unpredictable. And so empiric treatment is not often that helpful because you may not be treating with the right antibiotics for atypical mycobacterial infections. So is your, what is your approach? Is your approach early catheter removal for these or uh, a trial of empiric? Because it seems like the sensitivities may not necessarily be intuitive before we get them back after several weeks. Well, uh, I would say that this uh, appears to be the case everywhere, even in, our, in, in my center. The sensitivity and the culture result of the mycobacterium come back quite late. Like, uh, of course, we know this is not mycobacterium tuberculosis. We know this is some exifast bacilli you will be sent for it. But whether this is a mycobacterium fortrisium, mycobacterium abscess, we don't know until quite late. So uh, we usually have a sense because those, those exercise infections will be very nasty, very rare, very angry, a lot of discharge, pus. And, and then uh, if that's the case, uh, I will be more inclined to remove the catheter. Similar to mycobacterium, other tuberculosis, pseudomonitis, they cannot get away without catheter removal. But of course, if those are very frail uh, uh, patients who cannot even tolerate the hemodialysis, we have not much choice, then we will up, up, keep on uh, uh, using two antibiotics, be it uh, uh, carbapenem, linezolid, uh, uh, carifomycin, that kind of uh, um, um, actually cares about the sensitivities and then try to see whether we can control the infections. Right. Okay, great. One uh, couple more questions, um, one for you and one for Anna. So KM, what is your thought on emerging resistance and antimicrobial resistance with the use of exit site uh, prophylaxis, so topical ointment? Uh, is it a concern? Um, and uh, do you think that it's going to modify our treatment, to, our, our uh, prevention approach in the future? Yes, I think many of us are seeing pseudomonas organism resistant to gentamicin. So uh, we are now using more and more amikacin, that kind of uh, uh, big gun antibiotics. And probably because of the bacterial uh, uh, causing a lot of antibiotic overuse, we are also seeing a lot of MOT, as you mentioned, typical mycobacterium. So this is a big concern to me. So yeah. uh, sooner or later, we have to use more and more intraperitoneal or systemic antibiotic for treat, just, uh, so just for the sake of treating catheter infection, not for peritonitis. Yes, I uh, agree this is something that we need to look at. And that's why we need to shorten the duration of antibiotics as much as possible. Right, great. And another question for you that's a hit close to home. This has come up in my program around swimming. You know, there's swimming like laps in a pool every day for exercise. 
And then they're swimming, you know, once every few months on a beach vacation uh, where someone wants to dip their feet in the ocean. What, what's your approach when you're educating patients about PD where swimming is really important to them? If they are a regular swimmer, would you view that as a contraindication to PD or proceed with caution with the appropriate measures? Uh, definitely, definitely is not a contraindication for PD. PD should be adjusted to patient's lifestyle. If the patient is a swimmer, we should help them to make the exit site help while swimming. So emphasize the importance of cleaning the exit site just after they have their practice of swimming. But definitely is not a contraindication in my opinion. Okay, I hope I'm glad that this teleconference is being recorded. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and on that note, I just want to thank you two for such outstanding presentations. Uh, your expertise and knowledge today was so welcomed by myself and I'm sure all of the um, uh, uh, audience today on today's webinar. I want to uh, just remind everybody that's going to be recorded and please visit the ISPD and PDI website for the guidelines, for the podcast, for um, Anna's editorial and the patient editorial. I really, the, the hour has gone by so quickly and um, thank you to the ISN and ISPD for your organization of it and to our esteemed panel today and wishing you all a wonderful weekend wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you.